Welcome to another episode of the Bank Free Blueprint Podcast. And today I have with me Kathy Fetke. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you. And Kathy, you are co-founder and CEO owner of Real Wealth Network, a company that does real estate. Uh, help, helps uh, f- you help finance uh, contractors, developers, I believe. And you, you, mm-hmm. you're really, uh, you're very supportive with education and getting, uh, helping people helping investors get to where they want to go with, related to investing. Is that right? Yeah, we do. Uh, we've been, I think I was one of the oldest shows on uh, iTunes because I had a radio show in San Francisco and my husband put it on, on iTunes and suddenly we had listeners all around the world. Uh, so I've been doing this a while and, and I, I'm really so happy to see where the podcast world has gone because when I started, it was very difficult to get real world advice. You'd have to go to these real estate groups and listen to these quote unquote gurus selling boot camps and things people didn't really need and that maybe didn't apply. And so now I'm happy to be part of the movement that brings the the real information to the people so that we can all make better decisions when it comes to to investing. Yeah, that that's great. You've been, you have a lot of experience. You've been in the business for over 15 years, right? Yeah, we've been landlords for over 20. Mm -hmm. I've um, real wealth network is the organization we created to counteract all these, all these horrible, you know, uh, (laughs) real estate groups that weren't really teaching people what they needed. So we started real wealth network as a place where uh, real people could come and learn from each other. We'd bring, we just kind of pluck investors right out of the field to find out where, you know, where they're investing, what they're doing and how they're doing it. And, Nothing to sell, just education, and so we've had that group for uh, yeah about fifteen years now. Very cool, very cool. And you have you have two podcast show right now. You have the Real Wealth Show podcast and Real Estate News for Investors podcast. Those uh, uh, they sound both sound uh, very interesting. Yeah, Real Estate News is a daily show, about seven minutes. Just keeps you really up to date on ever changing real estate market and economics and. You know, you've got to understand market cycles or you could really get, uh, you could find yourself in another 2008 situation where you kind of wish you'd made different decisions, you know? Mm-hmm. So um, that, that uh, real estate news helps people stay current and it helps me stay current because I'm on national TV a lot and I want to know what's going on. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the Real Wealth Show, I interview successful investors to find out their secrets. So I oh. enjoy that. I've been doing it for a long time. Great. And yeah, and you mentioned your, uh, you do national shows. You've done Fox, uh, CNN, CNBC, NPR, uh, CBS Market Watch. You, you're, you're on as a guest uh, expert on those shows. Mm-hmm. I'm really interested to, to uh, hear what it's like. How, how, what, what is that process like for you? And how did you get to that point of being <laughs> Uh, that, it's, that, in that high demand. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of terrifying. Every time I'm on live TV, I, I usually want to faint, but um, I get I, I have breathing techniques. <laughs> uh-huh. um, no, it started where I was very active in the foreclosure world uh, when the markets just crashed and everybody was kind of wondering, what do we do next? We jumped into these dilapidated neighborhoods with all the houses boarded up and, you know, and brought investor money in and we bought those houses and we fixed it up and we, we helped improve neighborhoods. And, um, and so that got the attention of Goldman Sachs and I won an award as one of their, one of the top most intriguing entrepreneurs in the country and um, actually in the world, according to them, and got to go and and meet all the, I spent three days with all the other entrepreneurs, which included, I mean, huge names. It was, it was just incredible. The Uber guys were there. Mm -hmm. So it was amazing. We had solar city and, um, that sounds exciting. I I can imagine it was. And so I, that got me, uh, kind of in the news. And then from there, I got a call randomly when I was on vacation, totally unprepared that from Fox news, they wanted me to debate Robert Schiller of the Case Shiller Index uh, live on TV. And he had never agreed to debate anybody and wouldn't do it. But when they mentioned my name, he agreed because he didn't know who I was and <laughs> he wasn't threatened. But the, um, the topic, it was 2012. And the topic was 
he felt it was a terrible and dangerous time for people to be buying real estate. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's absolutely ridiculous. It's, there's never been a better time. 2012, the, the moment that we went on live TV together, it was literally the bottom of the market. And uh, so home prices were the lowest they'd ever been. Interest rates were the lowest. People could lock in a payment at, at a third or a fourth of what they'd pay in rent. So I just argued that he was basically wrong. And mm -hmm. he came around and, and agreed with me at the end. So I won a debate with Robert Schiller and that got me on the news after that. <laughs> wow, that's great. Can you, uh, after the show, maybe you can send me the link to that because we, uh, we put show notes in our, our podcast and we'd love to be able to... Uh, have a have a look at that. Absolutely, would love to. Great, and so that 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 has really put you on on the radar, and and that along with your success in business, can you describe what you you describe briefly how you got into it, but could you describe also what what is your business model? What is what is the core of what you do? With sure, real estate investing. I, I would say the core of what drives me and therefore drives the company is I, I got pretty burned, you know, in, in 2007, made some, made some really good choices and some I wish I'd, I'd done differently. And, uh, and I just never want to go through that again. And I don't want anyone else to have to go through that again, if they can avoid it. So, you know, I was telling people to get out of California, get out of the high priced markets and go into a place like Texas that was just the beginning of its boom. And I, and I had thousands of people listen to me and we helped them do that, but I didn't do it. <laughs> I mean, we did, we bought about 12 properties in Texas, but we didn't sell our California properties. So I lost a few million bucks uh, by not listening to myself. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what drives me is really understanding market cycles and the, and, and these days it's, it's really difficult because they're so manipulated. Everything is manipulated beyond anything that this country's ever experienced. And we don't necessarily know what the outcome will be from that. But uh, the more I can try to understand it and help others understand it, the more you can know whether it's time to buy, whether it's time to sell, to develop, you know, what's your timing on these? Because you don't want to get stuck in the middle of a renovation or in the middle of acquiring a large apartment building just to find out that all of a sudden there's going to be a, a shift and in, in more supply than de uh, more demand yeah more supply than demand mm -hmm. versus today where there's more demand than supply it can it yeah. can it can change on a dime and you got to know yeah. what to look at so the markets can change but you just hit on something that i think is just really key and that is uh the the word man you use the word manipulated and and I think that there there are different ways of looking at at that, and but specifically, I believe what you're you're sharing is manipulation, whether it's the news, uh, whatever whatever the message is out there, that it gets manipulated based on what certain groups either sometimes they they truly believe it, but a lot of times it seems like there's ulterior motives or or motives behind what 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 the discussions are. And the more that we can understand where everyone's motives are coming from, where they are, what is their underlying reason for taking the stand the way they take it, the more, the more uh, solid our decisions can be. And that's why I think what you're providing can be really helpful because you're offering a, uh, what I would say would be an unbiased sort of a neutral perspective because real estate in and of itself has so many different aspects, so many different ways to invest that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I, I think you, you definitely touched on something there that, that is really important. And that is to understand where, where people's motives are coming from and, and, and why, where their message is really uh, uh, originating from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's just uh in my recent uh, 2018 housing predictions, I, I did a lot of studying of graphs and charts and just trying to figure out what's going on. Why are we having this massive boom? Mm -hmm. And it became really clear that, you know, it's, it's really easy to be prosperous as a country when, uh, when you have a, borrowed a lot of money to get there. So in other words, I don't know if you have ever gone out and, and got some pretty good debt, like a big 
equity line or something. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember the first time I got a credit card, I felt rich. And, and the first time I, I went to a bank and they said, oh, we can give you a $250,000 credit line. I thought, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm in the money. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's all fun and wonderful. And you can invest in things and buy things and grow and, and do things you would normal, normally be able to do because all of a sudden you have this liquidity. And, um, and then one day you realize, you know, that the check or the bill comes and you gotta, you gotta pay. Right. And, and that's when it all comes crashing down when you can't pay. We, we already know that. Um, so here we are as a country going, wow, look at all this job growth. And, and, and president Trump is just, just so proud of the way the stock market's gone up and the jobs, you know, unemployment has gone down and he's taking credit for all of that. And yet right now they can't balance a budget. Mm-hmm. You know, and they can't balance a budget because it, it, it's 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 just impossible to do. We, we're twenty trillion dollars in debt, and so if if you can't have a booming economy when you've borrowed twenty trillion dollars, then you might as well just give up. Right. You know, and we're not. It's not like we're booming. It's it's not in parallel. In other words, a three percent GDP after twenty trillion dollars of debt has been acquired is is just not impressive. Yeah. So. So we have to be, we have to understand people are confused and they think that Trump's new policies are creating this. And that's just not, that's not it. Mm-hmm. It's quantitative easing and it's, it's a massive uh, influx of money into the money supply that people suddenly have access to cash. They can go do things. They can start businesses and buy houses. And, but when that's taken away, then everything reverses. And that's, that's what people have to keep their eye on is quantitative easing is a pouring of money into the economy, raising interest rates and, and uh, unloading the balance sheet is the opposite. It's a tightening. Mm-hmm. So now we're doing the opposite of what had the economy boom. And so you've got to keep an eye on it and just know that every time this, the Fed says they're going to raise rates, you should be shivering in your boots a little bit because mm-hmm. it's, it's, re, it's reversing the cycle. And, and so with that in mind, what, what are you sharing with investors now as advice that whether it's specific advice to the types of strategies that they do, or maybe it's more general advice, which yeah, I know part of what you're saying is pay attention to it and be aware of what's going on and understanding the dynamics and the principles that are, that are going on. So what, what do you share with investors now? Sure. I mean, you know, I look back at 2006 and I was so blessed to have people on The Real Wealth Show who could tell me what was going on because I knew something was wrong. I was a mortgage broker and none of it made sense, but I'd only been a mortgage broker for a few years and I just thought, okay, maybe this is the way people do things. They don't need to know if you can pay back this loan. <laughs> they, they don't need to know. You know, you can give $5 million to anybody. It's okay. Like it just didn't make sense, but mm-hmm. I didn't. So I started to have people on my show like Robert Kiyosaki who could explain to me that, no, this is not normal. This is a bubble. People are not going to be able to pay this debt back. And that's when the bubble bursts. And, and so he said, you want to get out of the bubble markets and get into markets that are not in a bubble. So it's really pretty obvious stuff. Sell at the, sell at the peak and buy at the trough. Um, don't, don't buy low, sell high. I mean, I mean, don't, yeah, Mm -hmm. sell low, buy high. Well, you know what I'm saying? Um, you want to get in and time it right. And so it, it was possible. And he showed me as, as did many other experts on the show to just take advantage of the unique opportunity to sell assets when they've peaked and exchange them for assets that haven't. And, and especially if those assets are cash flow based. Mm. And so we helped thousands of people sell their California properties in 2005 and 2006 and seven at the peak and buy in Texas at the trough. Texas was just beginning its growth cycle. So those people who listened to me didn't even know there was a recession because there was their properties in Texas that they bought never went down in value. Their, their rents went up consistently during the recession and they, they never lost their nest egg. They, they didn't feel it. Whereas people who, who bought the properties that they sold, you know, they sold all their California properties at the peak. The people who bought those did feel the recession because they were worth maybe half or a fourth of what they paid just a few years later. Yes. Yes. 
So that's the same thing today. You have the same opportunity to just go, okay, a lot of what's happening out there is fueled by free, easy money. It's the same, it's the same thing. No different. It's just packaged differently. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this is fueled. Where might it be a bubble? And, and where is there not one? And usually what determines that is the amount of cash flow you can get. So you can't get any cash flow in California. Uh, you can in some, some parts of California, but for the most part, not. Mm -hmm. And, um, but you can still in, in probably 60% of the country. So if, if you, if you look for good solid assets and growing markets with that have jobs that won't disappear during a recession, uh, then you should be in good shape. And second, um, you know, one of the things we're doing, there's a tremendous demand for, for housing. Uh, and, but you know, you've got to be very careful if you're going to build, you don't want to get in any major debt. So we do really creative, land deals where we'll buy the land, we'll re-entitle it and improve it and sell half of it off so that we own the rest of the land free and clear and are able to build with no, um, you know, if there was a massive recession, it wouldn't matter. We wouldn't, don't have debt on the property and we own it free and clear. We can build, we don't have construction loans. We just build and sell and use that money. So we're just very cautious. That's the best way I can say. Most of the risk out of the deal. By Yeah. Take the risk out. Mm -hmm. So, so, so that, that brings me to my other question, and that is that you, you really have, as I understand it, you have two aspects of your business. One is to, to help educate, to, to be a, a, a thought leader, to be able to advise people as to what, what, what business uh, ventures, they, what real estate investing they might uh, participate in, how they might do it. But the other part of it is the investing that you do yourself or that you invest alongside of other investors. Could you just explain that part of the business model? Um, how, we, how we invest with other investors? Yeah. Like, raise, yeah, sure. So over the years, we've built a, a membership base at Real Wealth Network. We're up to about 36,000 people who either are just learning or really are desperate to find something, a safe place for their money. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so we have since the beginning, as I said, helped people find alternative assets, something that maybe other people don't know about. Like back when we were telling people to buy in Texas, nobody, nobody was buying in Texas in 2004. I mean, California markets were on fire. I, I shouldn't use that word today, but um, <laughs> Cal mm -hmm. California markets were growing rapidly you could make so much equity that people were like, why would you go to Texas where nothing happens in Texas? But you know, what happens in Texas is cash flow. So we, you know, we showed people and taught people what cash flow meant because they were only used to equity gro growth and showed them how to maneuver uh, through the cycles in a really uh, graceful way, you know? And so, um, today we do the same thing. We help investors find the best markets in the U S uh, to buy cash flow properties today. And we, we refer them to teams in those markets who can find them those properties and, and help them renovate and help them, uh, manage, you know, provide the property management and so forth. So we have a whole network that way, but about seven years ago in 2010, I discovered that there was even more value to having a large network. And that was that together we could do deals that we could never do alone. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the power of the group. And, and so this member of our network said, Hey, you know, I've been a developer for 40 years. I'm finding ridiculous deals all over the place. I can't buy them all. Um, let's do this together. So he just started going to the banks and uh, in the commercial section and just picking up stuff for nothing. Subdivisions that had gone out uh, that had been taken back by the bank. They never got finished because these builders just lost all their, you know, their money and their, they had no credit. They couldn't finish their deals. And so we were buying land for like 10 cents on the dollar. He found, he found these almost finished townhomes, waterfront in Portland for, oh gosh, for $3 million for 27 of them waterfront. Wow. But the loan itself had been 13 million. Wow. And so, you know, he just said, I've got these deals. Do you think your investors would be interested? So, you know, I, I checked with our members and said, anybody interested in these? And within an hour, we had raised the $3 million for that uh, Portland deal. Mm -hmm. So back then, I didn't really know the rules around 
fundraising. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I I just kind of reached out to my network, which is okay. But now I know, you know, you got to be very careful. It's very highly regulated when you pool funds together, um, you know, in what's called a syndication or a crowdfunded deal. Mm -hmm. It is very highly regulated by the SEC. So, so uh, what yeah. you're doing, you are still doing the syndication, uh, but like you say, very, very carefully and very, yes, uh, yeah, it, it is very restrictive or, and regulated. So, yeah. Um, so when you're, when you're working with investors that either the, the, either it's a syndicated deal or maybe you're helping them find projects, let's say in Texas, is there a certain way that you like structuring the deals? Do you, do you structure it so that you, you or your investors go in as debt or equity or uh, mm-hmm. total ownership? Or what, what do you see? What is, what is a model that you typically like working with? Sure. We've done a little bit of all of it. Uh, mm-hmm. We had, we, I think what I'm best at is hearing the voices of our members. You know, I, I, I want to know what they want and then I want to find that for them. And so we've done a lot of equity deals where we get to, you know, partner with a developer and we get a part of the upside and that's all exciting. The problem is you've got $25 trillion in retirement funds today. That's tied to a very inflated stock market. And that's terrifying because most of these people are at an age where they can't probably afford a loss. And, um, and so a lot of those people want to have a portion of their portfolio be invested in real estate. And so if, if they're self-directing their IRAs and investing in real estate and they're an equity partner in a deal, let's say, you know, an active business where we're building houses and selling them or flipping land or, you know, doing some of these cool things, then they face UBIT taxes, which, which can be as, as much as 50% of the profit taxed within the IRA. And that's before they get their distributions and get taxed again. Mm. And so it's a double taxation that a lot of people didn't, don't know about. So they could make 25, 30% annualized return as an equity partner in one of our deals, but get 50% tax on that plus the tax when they take it out and, you know, just start to lose some of its luster. Absolutely. So, yeah. So we decided to structure a lot of our syndications as, as, as private loans because then they're then they're not subject to that UBIT. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if if it's so juicy, like we have a deal right now that's just kind of ridiculously fantastic, um, then they really should be an equity partner. Mm-hmm. Um, but otherwise, we we do it. We structure it. We give still a really high interest rate at between twelve and fifteen percent if it's a, a land deal. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but if if they're getting twelve or fifteen percent as a private lender or, you know, it's the same as if we were getting 25 to 30% as equity, you know, mm-hmm. if they're getting tax 50%. So, right. um, so anyway, that's, we, we, a lot of our deals this, this month we have a lot and, uh, and we structure so when, it that way. When the investors come in, they come in at, through a syndication probably rather than as all individual, let, let's say. Syndication. Yeah. A lot. Of, well, both. We do a little of both. Okay. Got it. And, okay. and the types of real estate that you focus on, it sounds like you, you are, um, you, you go after the ones that really make the most sense from a numbers perspective, from the market perspective. Is there any type, like any category of real estate that you really like working on above others? I, I think cash flow is one that you mentioned for sure. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I wish I could say I was an expert in multifamily. I'm just, I'm not. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I have a little envy there of people who know how to do that business. Um, but we, we definitely love buy and hold. Um, I, I love still buying these houses that are so far below the, um, their, their former value. So, you know, we're still finding properties that in the sixty seventy thousand dollars $70,000 range after all renovation that were in the hundreds before. Mm. So you're, you're kind of getting an undervalue plus really high cash flow. So I, I love that. Plus people can lock in long-term debt, 30 year fixed rate mortgages on, on single family. So I, I always tell people just max out your, your Fannie and Freddie loans, get as many single families as you can at, at low interest rates today and high cash flow. That's, that's a sure bet. Um, so, so we do a lot of that, but on the, 
so, on the what we've somehow become experts in is land development just kind of fell into it and now we're real good at it wow. so that's that's fun i have a question for you on that one but just before we go into that the when when you're looking at the i think you used like the sixty thousand to a hundred thousand dollar range obviously that's not most of california uh, and you did mention texas are there other parts of the country that you favor that you think there are sleepers or opportunities out there that are better than other places? Uh, as far as actual markets? Yeah, like geographic yeah. markets. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, you know, you've got to really look at demographics to understand what's what's happening out there. Uh, we can't overlook that there's 10,000 people turning turning 65 every day every day. So what are these people doing? The baby boomers have been driving the economy for 65 years, basically, you know, for a long, long time. And so they're going to continue to do that. It's a huge group. So where are they going? What are they doing? Um, you have a lot of people that are older, you know, a lot of seniors that did not prepare well and aren't going to be able to retire. So they're going to want to be in no state income tax states like Texas and Florida, Nevada. Um, they're going to want to be in more affordable markets. So they can sell uh, from the coastal markets. And, and you see, when you look at the map, you see them going to places like Oregon and Washington and Nevada. Utah is growing like crazy. Uh, Florida is it, just an onslaught of, uh, you know, people coming there. Texas, of course, these are fast growing markets. Um, and so you, you also have to be careful that you stay out of a bubble. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say that I'd be cautious of, Portland and Seattle, for sure. They've, they've really gone up quite a lot. Denver as well. Uh, Miami, New York, San Francisco, LA. These are, these are markets that have gone way beyond their last peak. So be cautious in those areas. But other, other markets are, um, I, I like to look at where there's job growth, where there's population growth, and where cities are reinvesting in themselves. Mm -hmm. So a lot of kind of the less attractive markets are becoming real attractive because there's been so much reinvestment like so Pittsburgh. much pressure on all the other areas yeah you've got you've got pittsburgh pennsylvania cleveland cincinnati i mean when you travel around and see what's happening to these cities it's it's incredible yeah and and so there's some real opportunity in a kind of the second and third tier cities for sure okay so and then back to the the point that you made about becoming you, you've sort of worked yourself into becoming the expert in development, uh, developing property. Do you, uh, I thought I recall that you had some projects going in Costa Rica? Yep, we have an amazing project there. It's, we're building a retreat center, but it's also a residential community, mm -hmm. uh, kind of expats who want to have clean water and clean air and you know grow their own food you stick a seed in the ground in Costa Rica and it just grows into food. <laughs> it's amazing. And, um, and so we're building like a residential community of about 40 homes, a little school there, uh, growing a lot of food and then having a retreat center uh, and a, like a hotel. So wow. yeah, it's really amazing. amazing. Mm. Working in, a, in a, um, a market like that, what are some of the things that you found or what is it that attracted you to that? Pro not only the project, but also that economy, that area, that market? Um, you know, mainly it was a developer with a tremendous amount of experience with passion for this project. And, mm -hmm. and so I really look at management first and foremost, what background does this person have? What experience? Uh, how, how deep are their pockets? Can they, have they done this before? Um, can they pull it off? Because, you know, I've had really good deals come to me with an inexperienced manager and they didn't go well. Yeah. Even, yeah. Even <laughs> though it's a, you know, great deal. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I've, got, I've got three guys that I think are on to something great, but I can't work with them because they're too young. They need to have somebody more experienced as a, as a partner. Absolutely. That's what, what you're talking about. That's for yeah. Sure. That's what I would tell people. If you want to do these syndications and these group projects and invest in someone else's project, look at management. What's their background? What's their track record? Is that track record in the exact same thing that they're offering you today? Yes. Because that's another mistake I've made is, you know, that, wow, they had a great track record in one thing, but that doesn't mean they do in another. 
Mm-hmm. You know, if, if you're an expert like me, I, I understand single family homes. I don't understand multifamily. People think I'm a all around expert in real estate, but no, there's things I definitely should not try to pretend I know how to do, yeah. you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, just on the Costa Rica uh, project, that one, one of the things that uh, seems like it would be really a positive for a market like that is to be able to go in and develop the project at more or less developing world uh, prices, developing country prices, and being able to get higher higher returns because it's expats or mm-hmm. whoever might be there. Is that is that an accurate assessment? Yeah, you know, you've a lot of people just don't like the trajectory of our country right now for good mm-hmm. reasons. You know, there's we're in massive debt. Uh, we're in denial. We've got massive entitlements we can't pay. Uh, no matter, I, I don't care if Trump was, you know, the next Reagan on steroids. You know, it, it, it's, I don't know what, I don't know how to fix this situation and nobody else does either. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there will be a price to pay. And, and so one of the things about diverse, you know, it's, to, to diversify is very, very important. Um, you know, buy treasuries from c- countries that aren't in debt. Put your savings in banks that aren't U.S. banks that are, you know, banks from countries that don't have the issues that we have. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, there, diversification is going to be more important than ever today because we've dug ourselves a, into a deep, deep hole that nobody really knows how to get out, but everybody's pretending isn't there. Yeah, yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Y- you have, uh, change uh, topics here a little bit, you, you have a family of two daughters, I believe? Two beautiful, wonderful Intelligent daughters, yes. And yes. Um, so, a question that I think of with someone who's as busy as you are, with the expertise you have and the the, the following, all of that. How do you? What do you do to create that uh, work? Um, personal work balance. <laughs> yeah. Oh, work balance. That's probably my biggest challenge in life. But. Mm-hmm. Um, you got to carve it in. You know, I think there's that old saying, if you fill up the the bottle with sand, you can't fit the boulders in. You got to put the boulders in first and the ah. sand can fit around it. So you've got to carve out special time. Mm-hmm. And and so I, I, I've i carved out, uh, you know, the week between Christmas and New Year's to just be with all our family. Oh. Um, just just yesterday, my daughter in college was, was very ill and I I had a live event I was putting on and I didn't go. I got on a plane and went to see her. Mm. Um, so it's just important to know your priorities yeah. and, and drop everything for, for those and plan for them. Yeah. And I'm not going to say I've been great at it. Um, there's been too many times I've been looking at my, my cell phone when I've got my, my children around me or my husband that should just be put away. Mm-hmm. And you know, that that's one of the problems with our world today is it's too easy for for interruptions to take us away from our priorities. Yeah. So, and those Rich, little subliminal messages that come along with it. Yeah. yeah and, the, and the stress. So Rich and I, my husband and I took a course called um, strategic coach, which challenges you to put that phone down for an entire day and be with the people you love uh, at least once or twice a week. Mm-hmm. And you schedule that in, you schedule something fun and you just know your, your to-do list will never end. It will always be there. It'll wait yeah. for you on Monday, but go take some time <laughs> off and be with, and create relationship because Rich Rich just lost his father last week and there wasn't one moment he thought about, wow, what did what did his father, you know, produce? You know, mm-hmm. how great was his job? It wasn't that. It was the, you know, wow, he, he spent this time teaching me how to build a, a work, you know, a, a tree house or you know, yeah. whatever it is. It's yeah. that one on one time that matters. Yeah, yeah. so true. Yeah. Keeping the priorities, uh, keeping the priorities straight. Yeah. Um Another question in the in the uh, in real estate in the in your business, what what would you say is one or two of the biggest lessons you've learned, or or maybe, um, or maybe even what what do you wish someone had told you when you got started mm. in real estate? Yeah, just to not trust people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I hate to say it; it sounds terrible, but I I think too many people just trust in in it, what you hope is humankind. Mm. And unfortunately what I've found is, is there, I've, I've met more people that are, that have their self-interest first than, than the interest of others. And, 
in this in any kind of financial realm you will mm -hmm. find that and so i don't want people to run around and not trust people but trust and verify yeah, yeah. trust and verify it's just you know you you i don't think i would buy a property or do a deal with my own family um, if I didn't have it in writing and I hadn't done the proper due diligence, just don't, don't do deals on a handshake. Um, yeah. 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 And that takes us back to, to what we talked about earlier about the, uh, what are the motives behind what people are looking for and the yeah. more you understand what, what motives are there, which is part of the due diligence. Then, then we start to understand what people are, what's driving people and, and where we can trust and where, uh, yeah. So I, I certainly understand that one. In real estate, one of the biggest lessons I've learned was that implementation is so, so critical. Um, you can have a great deal um, and poor execution and you have nothing. You can have an average deal and have great execution and you can, you can do really well. So um, just really important to, to know who we're dealing with. And uh, you have a book called uh, Retire Rich with Rentals. You're the author of that book? I am. Would you mind just sharing just a little bit about that and what, 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 uh, what messages you bring in? Uh, sure. Which... It's, it's a very introductory book on, you know, buying and investing in single family homes nationwide where there's cash flow. Mm -hmm. So it, it just breaks it down into really understandable steps. A lot of people get... Uh, paralyzed at at anything new, you know, and, and anything that, that you know, that with numbers. People can sometimes just go blank. And and so I wrote it such that a, a child could read it, and they have. I've had lots of kids read it and say they loved it. So it's very, very simple. But once you do your first deal, and I think your audience is more sophisticated, uh, but you never know. So all of it can seem daunting, uh, but when you do your first deal, and I, I do believe that a single family home is a great first deal because it's pretty easy to do, mm -hmm. and this book makes it even easier, then you've kind of taken yourself to the next level. You know, just take things one step at a time. You don't have to jump into a complicated deal on your first deal. Mm -hmm. Just do something simple, understand it, do a good job, do it right, make it successful, and then you can go and repeat that or, or take on the next thing. Yeah. Um, so that it's really just breaking it down so that, some of the barriers are gone. You know, it's funny. I won't say who, but uh, I was at a, a huge event last week with the massive, with, with all the major hedge fund managers of, uh, of the single family rental industry. And one of the guys who, who runs the, one of the biggest ones came up to me and he goes, you know, I'm so embarrassed. I've never actually invested myself. Uh, but he runs this fund and, and I said, listen, wow. that's what I, what I'm here for. I'll walk you through it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm actually helping him. <laughs> wow. That's... It's different when you're using someone else's money, you know, it's your money. <laughs> right, um, right. It's scarier. So. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Well, um, and if, if any of our listeners or viewers would like to reach out to you, get a hold of you, how, how might they do that? Sure. Uh, realwealthnetwork.com is our website, Real Wealth Network, and it's free to join. You get access to uh, all the data that we have done on the various markets that are, that are really booming right now and which ones you should be cautious of. Uh, we refer you to the teams that we've found in those different markets who can help you find properties and manage them and renovate them. And uh, so that's realwealthnetwork.com. And then, of course, The Real Wealth Show on iTunes. Excellent. Excellent. And we'll put them, we'll put the links into the show notes. So if anybody's driving while you're listening to this, don't worry about it. We'll have them in the show notes. You can uh, get all of the episodes of the Bank Free Blueprint on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, any of those platforms. And uh, yeah, I would love to hear any comments that you have. Kathy, this has been really a, uh, a great session, a great uh, uh, episode. I really appreciate you taking the time and giving out all the good information and appreciate it.